Well, we're in the book of Genesis again. We've gone away from it because of the Easter uh, season. And on a communion Sunday, we talk about salvation and we talk about some words that associate it with salvation, but we're back in Genesis. Genesis is a long book. It's 50 chapters long. It has two divisions. The first 11 chapters talk about the history of the human race. Chapter 12 to the end talks about the history of the Hebrew race. The father of the Hebrew race is Ab Abraham, Abram, and then changed to Abraham. Abraham has a son, the promised son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, and his name is changed to Israel. And so Israel then has 12 tribes, according to the sons. And then we're in Joseph, and that's the end of Genesis. So it is a book of beginnings, and it's a book about the human history. Some people said, how come I don't see... Uh, Anything written about the United States or Canada or Germany in the Bible because it is not uh, German or English or it is a Hebrew history. It's the history of the Hebrew people, the people of Israel. They're called Hebrews because Hebrew is the word that means having crossed over the rivers. And so Abram crossed over the Euphrates and Tigris River in order to go to the promised land. So they're all called Hebrews. When they get to uh, Jacob, Jacob is changed to Israel. They're called Israelites. And then they end up in the province of Judah, and the word Jews comes from Judah. And so those three names gives you a little bit of background of who they are. Well, we have a very interesting chapter before us today. We have three characters, and guess what? They all do wrong. Ha ha. Are you encouraged? Uh, well, we should be, because nobody's perfect. We all need God's grace, and we all need to strengthen our faith. So the takeaway lesson today, and you can see that up on the slide, the takeaway lesson today is that in great distress, in great distress and great affliction, believers should pray to the Lord because he hears. You and I need to pray to God in our distress. Whatever it might be, in our misery, in our pain, we should pray to the Lord because he hears us. He hears the afflicted, and we'll hear that in the story today. He sees us in our need. He sees those that are in need, and he will miraculously fulfill his promises for us. So that's the big picture, and that's the lesson that we want to take away from today. So if you go out for lunch with somebody and they say, what was the sermon about? All you have to do is repeat that sentence, and you're good to go. That God sees, God knows, and God will take care of it. And that's pretty much it. Our passage today is in Genesis 16. I'll give you a little bit of an outline. It's divided up into two sections. There is the first part, which is the first six verses, and it talks about the first distress or the first misery or the first affliction or the first hardship that is experienced, and it is experienced by Sarai. Sarai is barren. She cannot have any children, unable to bear, and uh, we will see that. In the second part, we see another distress from one tension to the other, and we see there's greater family dysfunction. Yes, even godly families have family dysfunction. Even in my family, there's family dysfunction. I don't want to be a part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. But we are all in challenging times. There is no doubt. So none of us are holier than others. And so we've got things to work on, that's for sure. And so we see a family dysfunction between uh, Hagar and uh, Sarai. And uh, there is hostility and there's conflict. One despises the other and one treats, treats the other really harshly. And you'll find out that one of them runs away from the problem. It's not good to run away from the problem. All right, let's uh, look at some observations from our passage today. Right away from the beginning, we see that Sarai, Sarai, Abram's wife, bears him no children. And so she had an Egyptian maidservant that it was named Hagar. So she said to Abram, she said, the Lord has kept me from having children. The Lord has kept me from having children. So guess who she's blaming for not having children? God, that's right. God has kept me from having children. Blames God. On the positive side, she admits that children come from God in the same sentence. And so admitting that God has prevented me from having children. So she grumbles and she complains. And she goes to uh, Abram and she says to Abram, guess what, I got an idea. 
You take my maidservant, Hagar. Remember when we were in Egypt, and we didn't pray about going to Egypt, and we ended up in Egypt, and then you told uh, the Pharaoh there that I was your sister instead of your brother, and remember all the mess that, well, guess what? Hagar was part of the gifts that the Pharaoh gave us, and so here we are, right? Here we are. So that's the problem. So anyway, you take Hagar, and she was probably much younger, uh, maybe a teenager of some sort, and then as a substitute wife, as a second wife, as a substitute wife, as a second wife. Now, she wouldn't be worth much, but the kid would be. The kid would be inheriting all that the father has, but not her. And so um, she took matters into her own hands. She took her own maidservant and gave it to Abram, and Abram went into her, uh, gave her, uh, and she conceived, and had sexual relations with her, she conceived. Now, a cultural note here that is really important is that when we look at the Bible, we, we approach it in a literal sense. We take it for what it says, black and white, unless it's obvious that it's not literally true. For example, Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is not a loaf of bread, okay? Jesus is the light of the world. He's not light. And so that's obvious that we don't take that literally, but otherwise we take it literally. We also have to take it in, cult in its culture, in its history, in its setting, in its context. Let's not spiritualize everything right off the bat, but look at it because there's a first audience, a first reader in the scriptures, and a second audience, and a second readership, and that's us. And so there are things, principles that are trans time. They transcend all of time. So they're true then as they're true today because God's word never changes. So the cultural note here that it was common practice at that time for the married woman uh, who was not able to have children, she would be shamed by her peers and looked upon, and uh, she would feel very depressed and down because she couldn't fulfill her role as a wife and a mother. And so oftentimes, uh, if they were wealthy enough and they had female servants, they would then um, give the female servant to the patriarch of the family and uh, to produce heirs. So the children that were born to the surrogate servant woman then would be considered the children of the first wife. And recently I read that this is how they do it. When the baby's ready to be born, the, uh, the mother, the wife, the first wife who doesn't have any children is barren. Uh, she has to come into the same room or in the same tent. She undresses and, and lies down, I guess, beside the woman that is giving birth. And when the woman, the surrogate mother gives birth, they take the baby and put it on the barren woman who uh, was not able to give birth, and so now it becomes her child, her child. And so that is a tradition that seems to um, be, bear out itself. So we get a, a vision of what this is all about. So both uh, Abram and Sarai, they were acting out in the customs of their day. And so let's not be too harsh to judge them because they considered uh, the situation, and, uh, and nevertheless, they were promised that they would have a son 10 years ago, when Abram was 75 years old, and they had traveled over to the promised land, and they were in the promised land, and now he's 86, and okay, we've waited for 10 years. Now, how long is God gonna answer this prayer, this promise? So they get very upset, and they get, up, they get, they get impatient, and they get frustrated. And so, God, you have to do something about this. And so, do their lack of faith or their weakness of faith, then uh, God would, uh, would not fulfill his promise. So, out of this lack of faith um, comes the series of other problems. When we take matters into own, our own hands, the results will be disastrous. Inevitably, hap this happens here when we take over for God and trying to make his promises come true through efforts of our own, that are not in line with what God has for us. And so through Sarah then arranges that Hagar have a child with Abram. And we can see in verse 5 what happens is that she initially blames God in verse 5. And she, when she knew she was pregnant, when Hagar knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And then Sarah and Sarai uh, said to Abram, you're responsible you're the one who did me wrong. You're the reason why I'm suffering. You know, and I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows that she is uh, pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. What she's saying is that the Lord will show who was right and who was wrong in this situation. 
So she blames God and she blames her husband. It was her who gave the made woman to Abram. You know, it's so easy for us to strike out in anger and frustration and accusations and blaming someone else rather than admit we're the ones who are wrong. You know, when you look at Adam and Eve, they did the same thing, right? Yeah, they seem to blame one or the other. Sarai then was very angry with Abram, and she took Hagar and mistreated her. So now you have two ladies in the house, and there is like fireworks, fireworks. I did a wedding once where the couple decided to do fireworks. They had, it was an evening, and the fireworks went up into the sky, and I told my mother all about, hey, there was fireworks at the wedding. She goes, fireworks come after you get married. <laughs> Oh, Mom, she is just wonderful. And so, you know, um, anger has a way of arising uh, and showing our own shortcomings when we just lose, lose it. And so their harsh treatment uh, for Hagar came to a point where she couldn't take it anymore, so she runs away. Have you run away? Have you run away before when you were younger, when you were older? Have you run away from circumstances, people, jobs? just packed it all in, thrown in the tile, and run away. Was that the right thing to do? I don't know. Looking back, God worked it out anyway, I bet. He worked it out anyway. I remember being a teacher in a Christian school, and we had devotions before we started our class. And I had 16, uh, 4 times 3 is 12. No, yeah, 12. I had 12 students in my class, grade 6, 7, and 8. And on that particular devotional that morning was the prodigal son, and we talked about running away. And I said, running away is not a good idea, because you end up in no place, not knowing what to do, no, ha having no resources, and so don't run away. I don't know why I talked about running away. In all the three years I was in that classroom, it was the only time I talked about running away. Well, at the end of the day, one of the students came to me and said, I wasn't going to go on the school bus today. I was running away from home until you told me not to run away first thing in the morning. Isn't God good? Isn't God gracious? The advice is there. Whether you know it or not, he prepares the way, and so we can trust him. That was a really a terrific time of confirmation that God is using me and using us. So the first tension we see is that uh, Sarah's, Sarah, Sarai is barren. And now that Hagar has conceived, there comes another tension. The two wives are at each other's, at each other's, I don't know, at each other. So a family dysfunction becomes even more complicated. Hagar is now gone, and she's gone with the baby. You know, what is Abram going to do? We wanted a baby in the family, and now she's run away. And Sarah's barrenness still remains. Problem unsolved. And so the situation gets worse, so what now? Have you found yourself in situations where you try to resolve it on your own and, and it's just gotten from bad to worse? Well, in, uh, in verses 7 to 12, we have a change. And we see in verse 7, um, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near the spring, a spring in the desert a spring in the desert. So we have the angel of the Lord. Well, the angel of the Lord is the manifestation of God himself. We have revelation. What is revelation? God shows himself. How does God show himself? He shows himself in creation. When you look at the trees and the birds and the seasons changing and the planetary motions, everything is in sync and God's handiwork is there. You can't help but know that in creation there is a God. A pastor, a previous pastor of mine, uh, went to Las Vegas area and uh, for some kind of a conference. He wanted to see the Grand Canyon. So at 2 o'clock in the morning, they loaded up a car full, and they went to the Grand Canyon in order to see the sunrise at the Grand Canyon. And they got there as the sun was rising, and there were some 120 people that were there. And they talked and introduced each other, and they had come from all over the world, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Holland, from everywhere. And you know, when the sun rose, and it showed and revealed all the layers of the, of the Grand Canyon on the other side. The crowd broke out in how great thou art. Isn't that amazing from all over the world? 
It was one of those God moments when you look at creation, you see the hand of God. God reveals himself in the Bible. This is his word, okay? It's the best seller, has always been. It is the authoritative word of God. It is inerrant, no mistakes. But this is the written word, but God also reveals himself in the living word, which is Jesus. And sometimes Jesus, God reveals himself in other manifestations, such as the pillar of cloud at night and the pillar during the day, the cloud at day, as he led the people of Israel through the desert. It was the fire that was burning the bush, and yet the bush was not consumed, and God manifests himself in fire. And so in this situation, God manifests himself as the angel of the Lord. Now, I believe this is a pre-incarnation. In other words, incarnation comes from carnos, which is Latin, which means flesh. So Jesus, being a spirit, takes on flesh. He becomes incarnate. And he becomes, he takes on humanity. And so he is both God and man. So this happens before the incarnation, before he's born in Bethlehem. And so he is God and he shows himself here. Some people take it as simply a messenger, a messenger of the Lord, because the, the word angel means messenger. And so I believe that it is God himself because later on in the passage, um, in verse 13, Hagar gave, gives the name to the Lord who said, to, who spoke to her. It was the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. You are the God who sees me. And so I believe that because of that, I have now seen the one who sees me. And so I believe that this is the Lord himself. So in the heart of this conversation, and in this particular passage, the dialogue, the conversation, he said, she said, he said, God said, is really important because that gives the meaning of what's happening here. God sees the distress and the affliction, and God hears the cry for help. You know, Abram and Sarai should have known better. It was Sarai who did not cry out to the Lord in her affliction. She blamed God. She blamed her husband. She took matters into her own hands. Hagar actually benefited from God's provision instead of Sarai. The Lord sent Hagar back, Hagar back to the tense situation. Would you like to go back to that tense situation that you ran away from? Well, we can see that the angel of the Lord gave her some advice. And in verse 10, the advice is this. Um, in verse 9, the angel of the Lord told Hagar, go back, go back to your mistress. Go back to your mistress. Now, if we jump back to verse 8, I want to show you something there that I thought was pretty neat. The first word that comes out of the angel of the Lord is her name. Isn't that interesting? That means God knew her. God knows you. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Jesus came, he walked, he looked up. First word he said was his name. He knew him. So God sees Zacchaeus, God knew, sees him, he knows him, God knows us. God saw Hagar in the desert, right beside the spring. God sees you in your desert. When things are dry and you've come to the end of your resources, you're in a desperate situation, you're in misery, you're in pain, you're in a distress and anxiety, God sees you. Calls you by name and then recognizes that she has a role. She's a servant. She's a servant of Sarai. Her place is not out here in the desert. Remember, she was an Egyptian young girl. She probably ran and went home because it says it was the road to Shur. And that's the road from the Holy Land, Promised Land, all the way to Egypt. She's running back home. But as a young girl, pregnant in the desert, no food, no resources, no help, she's out in the middle of nowhere, and then God addresses her and sees her, knows her, calls her by name, and asks a very interesting question in verse 8. says this, where have you come from? Does God know where she came from? Of course. You're the servant of Sarai. You got to go back. Where have you come from? And where are you going? God doesn't want to know the answer. God wants her to answer that own question. Let me ask you, where have you come from? Where are you now going? Are you going to a place that God does not want you to go? I hope you've come from a place that God has taken you away from and into his family. 
And so, what's up with you? Where you come from? Where are you going? You know, we lived out in the country near Ipawash Beach, and there were many people who lost their way. And one Labor Day weekend when I was having a garage sale, a lady drove up the side, uh, driveway, my gravel driveway, and she said, I've lost the way. I don't know which way to go. And I said, there's only two ways. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. And she was shocked. I said, I'm so sorry, ma'am. I said, I'm a pastor. And he just kind of like came out real quick. But you know, which way are you going? Right? I bet you'd made her think. She'll never forget that. And so uh, ask yourself, where are you coming from or where are you going? And so we see in this, uh, parag- uh, we see in this te- um, passage here uh, that three people in the passage all make mistakes. Number one, we see that Sarai takes matters into her own hands. She gave the maid to her servant, Abram. And so you can see that up on the slide. Sarai took matters into her own hands. Abram went along with it. Now, Abram should have been the man of the house and said, listen, this is not what God wants us to do. You know, it might be culturally okay. There are many things contemporary that's cultural okay. It's okay with the law, but it's not okay with God. And we are God's people. We need to live differently. And so Abraham just went along. He was a... He was a man who didn't step up to the plate. It reminded us of uh, Adam when uh, Eve took the uh, fruit. He was standing right there. He didn't speak up. Man, we need to stand up. We need to stand up. Promise Keepers is a program, is a group of men that are challenging men to be the men in their homes, to be men in their churches, to be leaders where God has placed us to be. Abraham went along with the plan. He refused to help solve the problem. And Hagar, well, she ran away from the problem. So let me ask you, uh, which character do you identify with this morning? You see, when we study the word of God, we have to apply it. We have to see where it hits us, where we are at. So are you a person who always takes matters into your own hands? You function in the flesh and not in the spirit. You do what you want to do, irregardless of what people are thinking or what is best for the whole. There's a time when we get married, you know, there was a time when I was not married. I said, I can do this and I can do that. But now that I'm married, I go, we got to do this. It's not you and against me. It's we, ours, together. Okay. And I remember when we first went out, we had pizza. You know, I was so giving and I said, you know, what kind of pizza do you want? She goes, I like Hawaiian. I hated Hawaiian. She goes, Hawaiian, okay, we'll have Hawaiian. I submitted to that. And then a little while later, I thought, you know what? I don't really like Hawaiian. So I said, you know, I like uh, all meat. So then we agreed, okay, half of the pizza will be Hawaiian and half will be all meat. Well, now we order two. I get my all meat and she gets her Hawaiian. But you know, it's the idea of working together and you know, what's good for both of us? It really doesn't matter, you know? We do something that she wants to do that I'm not thrilled about, and then she does something that for me and with me that I enjoy much more. But we get it, we go through it together. And by the way, I want to say that Claire is a beautiful lady, and uh, I'm so thrilled that she's in my life. She's been so supportive uh, of everything that has happened here. Um, Yeah, so she's God sent, that's for sure. I asked her three times to go out, you know, for coffee and uh, dessert after church, evening church. She, she finally said yes. The third time, she has to say, I'll have to take my boyfriend first home, and then I'll come and see you. But anyway, enough of my marriage situation, right? And so which, which uh, are you? Now, what does the passage say to us? It says, when we take matters into our own hands, we interfere with God. When we take matters into our own hands, we interfere with God. When we say the Lord's Prayer, we don't say, my will be done. We say, your will be done. Are you submitting to what God has for you? You may not like it, but it is the best plan for you. And we must wait on God. Don't hurry God up. We must wait on God. We must wait on God. And there is there something, is there something in your life that you are waiting on God for? Are you waiting to God to heal you of a disease? Are you waiting for one of your children or grandchildren to be saved? 
Are you waiting for, what is it that you're waiting for? Are you patient with it? Do you realize that God may say, no, that's not for you? Are you waiting upon the Lord? Waiting upon the Lord doesn't mean that you sit down and don't do anything. You actually uh, stand there and you actually get busy. Busy being faithful to what you have on your plate to do. And so be prayerful and be faithful because in his time, in his time, he makes everything beautiful in his time, right? And so we praise God for that. All right, let's, uh, let's review what we started off. Our plan this morning was to uh, look at the next slide, and it says, in times of great distress, we should pray. So pray. Jonah was in the bottom, uh, in the valley of the big fish, he prayed. Daniel was in the lion's den, he prayed. Okay, whatever circumstance you are in, pray. Why? Because God hears you. God hears your affliction. God sees us in our need. And will you admit that you have a need? Sometimes we're so full of pride, we want to do it all ourselves. And so see the need in your heart and see the need in your life. And God will fulfill his promises for you. Because Philippians 1, 6 says that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. That's a promise. Maybe not in our time, but in his time. And so as we make application today, as we go away with things that we need to do, we practice what we're told and we practice what we learn, we apply it and we share it with others, we need to remember that we need to trust God's word. God's word is true. It is trustworthy and uh, patiently wait for his promises. Trust and obey for there's no other way. When we adopt the earthly uh, customs around us, that is foolishness because it will continue to complicate the matters with increasing tensions. So let's live wisely, wisely. Not everything out there is for us. You know, the problem that the ship has in the water is not the ship being on the water. The problem is the water in the ship. So if you are the Christian, you are a Christian. The problem is not you being a Christian who is in the world. The problem is the world being in the Christian. And so let's live pure and holy lives. Trust God. And then the second thing from um, the Hagar's experience for us today is that no matter what the affliction or the distress might be and how it all came about, you know, whether Sarai was justified to mistreat her uh, because she gave back what she got and all that stuff, there's no reason for it. How it came about, God sees it and God knows it, and God will take care of it. First John 4.4, 4, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And in Romans 8, 31 to 39, we're reminded that we're more than conquerors through Christ. And so we can live a holy life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lesson today. We thank you that um, people in the scriptures, Abram, Sarai, and Hagar, um, are people just like us. They made mistakes. There was a time in their life when they took matters in their own hands. They didn't step up to the plate and do what they were told and should have done. And then sometimes we just run away from the problem. So we, we are really like them. They are like us. But we have something that uh, is really precious, and that's the indwelling Holy Spirit, that you can lead us and guide us as we surrender our will to you and submit to your leading and guiding. May you live through us. May we who have been blessed be a blessing, for this is what you've called us to do, to love you with all our heart and to love our neighbors as ourselves, to live peaceably one with another. And so give us the courage to do what we need to do today. Maybe there's a reconciliation, a forgiveness, whatever it might be. Help us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers thereof. In your name we pray. Amen. What are you burdened with today? Will you just tell him right now in your heart? Tell him out loud in a whisper. Just give it to him. Give it to him right now. And walk out here lighter. The Lord bless you and keep you. God make his face to shine upon you and God be gracious unto you. God give you his countenance both now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray with thanksgiving in our heart and praise to the goodness and the glory of God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.